Hi, I'm Greg McDaniel, lead teaching pastor here at Grace Covenant Church. And we're excited about this opportunity we have to share the glorious gospel of Christ with you today. We pray this sermon's a blessing to you, but I also want to remind you what it tells us in Hebrews. It says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the habit of some is, but we're to encourage one another to love and good works. The way we do this is by physically coming together, uniting together, and building each other up. And so whether you are a member here at Grace Covenant or just listening online, I want to remind you that this is just a supplement to your Christian walk and in no way is meant to replace the local church or the pastors that God has brought into your life. And we have a lot to talk about today as we end our mini-series on the tabernacle. Today we see the last bit of furniture, and that is indeed the Ark of the Covenant, or what I'm going to specifically call the Ark and the Mercy Seat, and there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about it as we get into this today. But I do want to review, as we've done every week that we've been in this study of the tabernacle, the tabernacle, amazing mystery, if you will, because God, the God of the universe, chose to dwell among his people. That's amazing in itself. And yet this place where he chose this little tent in the middle of a desert, in the midst of a, 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 a people that really aren't worthy of him, and yet he chooses to dwell in their midst. And we said the tabernacle, a few things about it. Obviously, it had an outer fence of white linen, and uh, this pictured what? What did that fence picture? That white linen fence keeping people from God. God's what? Purity. His righteousness, his purity, yes. And how many doors did this have? One. What side was the door on? Jesus. Yes, yes. One door on the east side, which pictured who? Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Jesus Christ is the door. He is the gate. He's the one door, the one access to the holy God of the universe. And then we move right in to this first area, this first piece of furniture where an atonement was made, an animal was sacrificed here, and this was called the, the brazen altar. Yes. And upon this altar is where atonement took place. What do we mean by atonement? Substitutionary atonement. The death of the innocent for the guilty. And that's what happened day after day uh, at this altar. An animal was brought in, hands were laid upon the animal, sin was figuratively transferred to the animal. The animal then died and in place of the guilty sinner now the priest could go on behalf of that person on into the presence of God in the tent of the tabernacle. Then we came to this next part, this next furniture, where the priest would ceremoniously wash his hands and feet, and that was called the laver. Yes, the brazen laver. And then we enter into the tabernacle tent itself, and we saw a piece of furniture. The first thing you came to, it displayed some bread, and it was called the showbread, the table of presents, if you will. And how many loaves were on this table? Twelve. Now, what did this bread ultimately picture? Who is the bread? Jesus. He is the bread of life. But since there were 12 loaves, how many tribes were there of Israel? Twelve. So this pictured God's people on display in his presence. And if we are in Christ, does, who else does this picture? Us, we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ. We are on display in the very presence of God because of Jesus Christ. Then we move over to the only provision of light within the tent, and it was called the, the golden lampstand. Yes. Hold your enthusiasm, please. We've got to get through this. The, the golden lampstand, which, which basically pictures who? And he is the what? light of the world. But also we saw on the ornamentation of this candle or this lampstand, we saw almond buds and almond fruit. And what is that a picture of, the, the almond blossom? First fruits, which is ultimately telling us about Jesus and his resurrection. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we move on to that altar of incense. It was the golden altar as compared to the brazen altar. And this was, the, I'll go ahead and finish this up for us. This was where the priest came and he offered incense and he prayed on behalf of the people. And yet that was based upon the atonement work done on the brazen altar. The, the, yes, the reason, the reason that he could 
represent the people of God and pray on their behalf was because of the sacrifice that had already taken place. And Jesus is our high priest, according to Hebrews, and he ever lives to make intercession for us based on his atoning work on the cross, his shed blood, that he will always plead before God. He will always point to his perfect blood sacrifice and plead for his people. That's the beauty that we've seen so far. Now we look at this last piece of furniture, and there it is behind that great curtain that was, that was three feet in, in, in width and length, heavy curtain separating all people from the very presence of God. And only once a year, the high priest, not any priest, just the high priest, could go behind that curtain and offer uh, or remind God of the, the atonement that was made. It was called the Day of Atonement, and it would cover the people's unknown sins. This is the grace of God. Many uh, passages would mention how that it was for the unknown sins of the people that they committed unwittingly. And it would cover about a year, right? A year, not about a year. It would cover a year. Every year, the priest would have to repeat this offering. But here it is. This is what it looks like. This thing called the Ark of the Covenant. Basically, folks, I want us to notice this, and it was, it was gold. The only thing that's not actually good about this picture is that those those handles, those sticks should be gold as well because everything was covered in gold. But nonetheless, we had a great picture here. We know we don't have the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Indiana Jones has not found it yet despite his popular movie. And yet we get a glimpse of it here because God was so precise in his instructions, we can get a vivid picture of what it looked like. And basically, folks, the Ark of the Covenant itself, the Ark is nothing more than a box. It's a chest to store things in. Okay, and there you have it. The bottom part of that is basically a storage chest. And the top part is what you call the mercy seat. This is a separate piece. It's the lid that went on top of the chest. And together you have the Ark of the Covenant, but you have two pieces. You have the Ark and you have the mercy seat. And that's significant in just a few minutes that we remember. So get a good look at this. The angels were on top there, the cherubim precisely. And we're going to talk about their significance as well. So get this in your mind. Everybody, gaze upon that picture and get that picture and that image in our minds of what the mercy seat and the ark look like. Now let's go to Scripture and let's look at this description in Exodus 25, verse 10. Before we do, let's pray. Father, we pray now that you will bless your word. We pray your Holy Spirit will come and get us out of the way and that you will give us the ability to receive your word. Prepare our hearts. Humble them. God calls us to admit that we are needy people, that we need your grace. We need your filling today. We need your illumination to understand these wonderful truths of your redemptive plan. And all of this we pray for the glory of Christ in his name. Amen. Now verse 10 says, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside shall you overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it, and you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. Now, what is that? All right, what is this testimony he's talking about that's going to go inside this ark? Well, we have that given to us. If we go to Hebrews, again, which is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies about the tabernacle, we can see in chapter 9, verse 2, it says this, For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was the second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was, here it is, here's what was in it, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Now, let's stop there. This is the three things mentioned that were inside that chest, if you will, that, that box. We had a little urn full of manna. Manna would remind the people that God is their Jehovah Jireh, the, the God who provides. He provided their food through the wilderness. The next thing we saw was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember a few weeks ago we saw this, maybe two weeks ago, where that rod, that, that rod 
was, was laid with all the other rods of the leaders of the 12 tribes in the tabernacle, and God was anointing and calling his high priest, and Aaron's rod was chosen, and the way God signified that was to cause it to come to life, like a resurrection, and the, and the rod began to bl- bloom, and what did it bloom? Almond flowers, almond blossoms, and so that was put into this ark, but here's the big one, and the tablets of the covenant, basically the Ten Commandments, those two tablets that that contain the morality of God. And so the the amazing thing about this, now there are other accounts in in the Old Testament. After the ark was returned, after being stolen and several things had happened to it, the, the one thing that's mentioned is the, t- the tablets of stone. The other things aren't mentioned, but the tablets of stone. So we know one thing is very important here is that the law of God is in this, this ark, okay? And what is the law of God? We've already said it is the very nature of God. They're not a bunch of, just a bunch of rules. The Ten Commandments are the very nature of who God is. They reveal to us his morality, and that's who he is. So very powerful. And I think I really want us to get this. So do not forget that it was the Ten Commandments that were in that ark, okay, in the, in the very heart of that, that, that box, okay? Uh, and what do the Ten Commandments do? They condemn us. They call out for the wrath of God to fall upon us. They accuse us. They reveal the fact that we are not perfect, that we are not holy, that we have broken God's holiness, and therefore they cry out for the wrath of God to come against us. So that's what the law does. It's, it's, this, uh, a, it, it's, this, it can, it's a condemner, right? I mean, it shows us God's holiness and therefore shows us our unholiness. And look at verse 5. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadow were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, all right? So the mercy seat is a separate piece, and it's a lid. And what does that lid do? It covers the law. And that's important. I want us to get this picture as we go through this. We're going to see, again, God's mercy and grace found only in Christ literally cover the law for us. They don't do away with the law, but in Christ we know that the law is fulfilled, and therefore now the law doesn't condemn us anymore, okay? It's fulfilled in Christ because of that mercy seat, and that's all going to be explained here in in the rest of this message. But let's continue now back to Exodus 25, 20. I want to talk about this cherubim on the lid for a minute. It's a beautiful picture, and again, it's amazing to think about the fact that God so inspired these workmen that they could take, it was one piece, they could take that one piece of gold because the lid was one solid piece, just like the lampstand. And those are the only two pieces of furniture that were one solid piece of gold. And so this lid was just beaten out of one piece of gold. That's amazing. But here it is. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Beautiful. So these cherubim, these angels of God, facing each other, but their gaze is not at each other. It's downward on the mercy seat, okay? So interesting to see this. Why? Because on that mercy seat, folks, this is it. This is the culmination of the redemptive plan of God, the eternal redemptive plan of God. This is a foreshadow of that completed plan, okay? Again, what do we say the mercy of this whole tabernacle is? It's a little model of God's heavenly throne. And ultimately, it's a picture of his total plan of redemption. So what we see then in this place is this beautiful promise of redemption. I want to quote from you from a book by Edward Fisher, Read about 1645. It's called The Marrow of Modern Divinity. And a beautiful passage here is he talks about this tabernacle and this, this foreshadowing of this, this plan of God. Because I believe people got it, folks. Here's why I say this. Because you take, you take Adam and Eve. They understood that it was substitutionary atonement that God was looking toward. After they sinned, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. That didn't work. God took and slain an innocent animal and took the skin and covered them. And he began from that day on to teach and to prophesy that there would be a Messiah, one who would finally come to take away sin. That's what they looked forward to. Now, years go by, and the Israelites, or they weren't even Israelites at the time, but God's people rebel against him generation after generation, and they leave God. And then you go years and years down the road, and now 
they find, the Hebrews find themselves in bondage in Egypt. They've forgotten all about God. They don't even know the true God, okay? And yet there was a point when this was taught, but now it's forgotten. And what does God do? He redeems them from Egypt, brings them to the wilderness, and right away at Mount Sinai begins to reteach them who he is and what his redemptive plan is, his covenant of grace, once again being re reintroduced to these people. And so I believe then, along with Edward Fisher, and I'll just read what he says, because I think as they come to this tabernacle now, and they're beginning to once again learn and understand of God's promises, listen to this. There is no question but every spiritual believing Jew, when he brought his sacrifice to be offered, and according to the Lord's command, laid his hands upon it whilst it was yet alive, did from his heart acknowledge that he himself had deserved to die. But by the mercy of God, he was saved, and his sin laid upon the beast. And as that beast was to die and to be offered in sacrifice for him, so did he believe that the Messiah should come and die for him upon whom he put his hands, that is, laid all his iniquities by the hand of faith. And what that is saying I agree with, and I would say most evangelicals would agree, that those saints of the Old Testament are saved the same way saints are saved today in the New Testament era, and that is looking toward the Messiah. They looked forward to his coming. We look back to the fulfillment of his coming, and yet it's the same. And that was always the promise of God. And so this whole Levitical system was set up to point people not to put their faith in a priest or a system, but to look forward to the ultimate fulfillment of these types and shadows. Uh, Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. I'll read that to us again just to show us what he's talking about there. Here's the Day of Atonement, and here's what happened uh, during those offerings. He shall offer, him, uh, offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. This is a person bringing their sacrifice to the tabernacle. So in their heart, what are they thinking? Well, they, they bring it to the Lord, and then it says, he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So again, that's the beauty of this tabernacle, okay? This is what God is teaching us, as well as the people uh, uh, of the Hebrew nation as well. Now, having said that, having said that, this is a mystery, right? And those angels are looking at this mysterious thing called the mercy seat. Why is it so mysterious? Well, the cherubim, by the way, are mentioned first in Genesis when God moves Adam and Eve out of the garden because of their sin. He places what? A cherubim in front of the garden, a flaming sword guarding it. They're not coming back in. The cherubim throughout the scriptures seem to be connected with God's judicial uh, rules, carrying out his, his orders in that sense of, of justice, I believe it's the cherubim who would flood this earth if God gave the order to destroy sinners because of our unholiness, and he would be perfectly just in doing so. These are those who would carry out his orders of justice. They understand that. They were created for this. And yet, the interesting thing is, they're introduced to something new called a mercy seat. They're hearing, uh, they, they're, they're understanding that God has now this plan of redemption, and where are they going to learn about this? Well, Ephesians 3.10 gives us a hint. It says, so that through the church, by the way, the church, according to Ephesians and all through the New Testament, is the pillar and ground of the truth. The church, which is the assembly of the believers, just a group of believers, and yet God has chosen to put his truth among his people, okay? And so that, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. And that's why we preach, and what is the manifold wisdom of God? Ultimately, it's Christ. And that's why Paul said, we preach Christ and him crucified. That's what we preach, because the manifold wisdom of God is ultimately Christ. But notice this. Who are we teaching? Not just us, but look what it says here. That it may be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. We're talking about the angelic beings here. They don't get redemption, folks. They don't understand this. And they're looking in to our church services. They're hearing us preach what? The word of God. They're hearing the gospel. They want to find out what is it. They're built for justice, this cherubim. They're built to carry out the wrath of God upon sin, but now they see a mercy seat, and they're gazing upon it in wonder and wanting to find out more of the depth of God's grace 
and his riches. Write this down, 1 Peter 1, 12. This is another example of the angels learning and, and have to listen in to our worship services. This is pretty sobering, folks. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the gospel, and look at this, things into which angels long to see and look. The gospel that we preach, the angels are, it's so funny, we take it for granted to go to church, right? We take it for granted to hear the gospel. We hear about Jesus, blah, blah, blah. The hosts of heaven are on their knees looking over with bated breath, listening to the gospel and worshiping God for his love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness as they see it unfold. It's amazing. And I just think it's a picture of those cherubims. They gaze into the mercy seat and they're looking at it in wonder. Wow, beautiful. Okay, let me continue. Exodus 25, verse 17. Back to this. Look, what it, look, look at this. This to me is the most stupendous part of this account. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. So there's the separateness again. Remember, you get the Ark of the Covenant. It holds the law, the Ten Commandments. But then you get a mercy seat of pure gold. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the Ark. And in the Ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. And we've already talked about that. Verse 22. There, here it is. There, on that mercy seat, there I will meet with you. Amazing. Sovereign God, creator, sustainer of the universe, self-existent, needs nothing or nobody, chooses to meet with his people there. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you. And I think we fail to consider the gravity of this verse. Amazing. Every week we fail, I think, as human beings to grasp the significance of meeting with the God of the universe, being able to meet with him, not face his wrath, which is what we should. The only, the only kind of relationship we should have with God is on the, the, the bad end of his wrath. And yet... He says, there's a mercy seat where I want to meet with you. Whew. It's amazing. Sobering, somber, and I, I, I just want to, I want to, I want to give you something in Hebrews that talks about this God that we're talking about, this God that we deal with. Because how does God meet with us and how does he speak with us? We saw it already when the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai and God spoke. He speaks through his word. And it was his word that caused him to tremble and to quake and to faint and to, and to drop and run the other way. God speaks to us through his word. He still speaks to us through his word. Look what Hebrews 4 says in verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, and look at this, to whom we must give account. See, this again is the things that we don't like to so much gaze upon. We like to talk about coming to God's presence like we're going to meet a buddy. Hey, going to party, party with God today. Woo, have a good old time. Hey, big man upstairs. Flippantly, we come to God. And yes, we rejoice as believers, and we have joy from Him, and, and there's a fellowship with Him. We understand that. But we cannot forget that all of that is, is solidly placed upon the foundation of a fear and awe of who He is, and a respect, and a reverence. Because we're not talking about another human being that happens to have a little more morals than we do. We're talking about a being we can never comprehend infinity outside of our dimension. He wants to meet with us. 
How do we approach it? And this is what we must do. We must give an account one day to him anyway because he already knows the intent of our heart. He knows why you're here today. He knows your motives. He knows what you think. He knows what we do. He sees those actions in the dark when we think nobody's around. He knows it's all being recorded in heaven. And one day we will give account to him. It's amazing. And yet we have this strange feeling. I want to give you a quote from A.W. Pink from The Sovereignty of God, which says it so well. The God of the 20th century is a helpless, effeminate being who commands the respect of no really thoughtful man. The God of the popular mind is the creation of maudlin sentimentality. The God of many a present-day pulpit is an object of pity rather than of all inspiring reverence. This is true. I think we've asked for it. We've stopped immersing ourselves in the Word of God, which reveals His holiness, which reveals His awesome power, His greatness. Folks, you cannot be in the presence of God's Word, immerse yourself in it, hear it preached, and God not get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you not diminish and decrease. Impossible. We cannot be exposed to God in His Word and flippantly approach Him anymore. It's impossible. When we see the God with whom we have to do, when we see that God revealed in all of his holiness, the only response for us is to be in awe and fear him and respect him. Which ultimately then, as we'll see here, leads to rejoicing in him, fellowshipping with him, enjoying him forever. But let's notice, we cannot stop, we cannot, we cannot, skip, rather, past this part of who God is, as many, many want to do. I mean, I understand. It's, it's just not a humanly popular thing to do. And yet it is exactly where we need to be first and foremost to gaze upon God. But I want to show you what happens when you forget God and you forget who he is. And really, the people that forget God the most are his people. If you never knew God, it's hard to forget God. <laughs> but if you knew God, wow. So look at this. Here's a story in 1 Samuel. The Ark of the Covenant, by the way, was stolen by the Philistines. The people of, of Israel forgot about God. They began to worship they, 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 they worship idols. They committed adultery on God, and they cheated on him with other gods, and, and they forgot him. And a part of that judgment, ultimately, is that the, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant. They put it in the temple of their God. And it doesn't end well for their God. Strange things start happening there as their God keeps falling on his face and his head falls off and his arms fall off and this is bad stuff happens. And so they say, we got to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> we got to send this back to the people of Israel. So they attach it on a cart with, with uh, bulls and, and what do you know? Nobody goes with it, but these bulls, they go right down the road and nobody's guiding them. They're going right back to the people of Israel. What do you know? And as it comes into the, 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 the first city of uh, Beth Shemesh, the people rejoice because they see the ark and they remember, oh, yeah, look at that. Cool, there's the ark. And they get very excited and, and along the way, somebody gets the bright idea, well, let's take a look inside. Wow, they forgot a lot of stuff, evidently. Because it's not a good idea <laughs> to, to, to even touch the ark. That's what those poles were for. Nobody touched the ark. The high priest didn't even touch the ark except one time a year, as he sprinkled blood, and we'll look at that. And yet they got an idea. Let's take a look. Well, verse 19 says this. What happened? Well, he struck some of the, the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into. I know it says upon in the ESV. Most translations go ahead. This word can be translated into or upon. Into. They looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them. 70 men within that parameter of the ark, when they opened it up, died. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Now look at verse 20. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Of course, the answer is nobody isn't it funny? The Philistines knew better than to even try to open this thing. It was God's people who seemed to have forgotten. 
of his power and his glory. But folks, the truth is this. None of us can stand before a holy God. This is the results for all of us who ever try to come into the presence of God by our own merit, by our own works, by anything that we can offer. We are not compatible with holiness. And this is the result. When, when unholiness gets near holiness, the unholiness is destroyed. The wrath of God must lash out upon unholiness. Okay? Wow. So this is why this is such an awesome thing to me. God meets his people in this place. The very presence of God. Okay. And they live. Why? How can this be? Back to Leviticus 16. Look at this. This is beautiful. This, this is taking us to the, the Day of Atonement. Every year again, the high priest would go in on behalf of the people and atone for the sins. This is why God could meet with them. Okay? This is it. This is why the wrath of God didn't pour out throughout the camp of Israel and destroy everybody. This is why. The high priest, and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side and again, that's beautiful in itself. What was on the east side? It was the door. It was Jesus. He put the blood on the mercy seat, commemorating, pointing toward that east side, which I believe again points towards Christ being that ultimate lamb of God. But look at this. In front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. And again, throughout Scripture, seven is that number of completeness, perfection. This, one, this, this foreshadowed the one-time perfection of Christ offering once for all. It was looking forward to it. Of course, this had to be repeated every year. This was just a type. But it was pointing to the one day when the perfect blood of Christ would once for all take away our sin. However, we cannot forget that it's the re this is the reason that God could meet at that mercy seat was because the blood had been shed. Atonement had been made. Okay? Now, bear with me here as we look at this principle because this is what we got to get. Mercy seat. All right? Mercy seat is the word kaporath in, in Hebrew. Kaporath, mercy seat. You say, big deal. And I agree. Hebrew, right? You don't use it much. I don't use it much. But there's a reason I'm using this today. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. So you got the Hebrew words being translated into what they would be if they were in Greek. And the word for mercy seat is Helasterion, which is propitiatory. Propitiatory. This is, a, this is beautiful. The word propitiatory is not the word propitiation. Propitiatory has to do with propitiation. It deals with. It points to propitiation, but it's propitiatory. Uh, this, is, this is beautiful. So literally, literally in the Old Testament, here in Exodus, the word mercy seat could have said God has met them on the propitiatory, a noun. A, it's a monument, we could say. What is a propitiatory? It's a monument in commemoration to propitiation. It's not where the propitiation takes place, but it's a propitiatory. It's pointing to propitiation. Uh, propitiation. All right, here, here we go. Look at this. Look at this in, in Hebrews 9.5. This is where it happens in, in, in the Septuagint. We've got Hebrews 9.5, and it's translated... Uh, above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, which in the Greek is the word helasterion, the same word I just showed you, which is propitiatory. So the mercy seat or the propitiatory, okay? Those are synonymous. Oh, this is beautiful. Now, what is propitiation then? If it points to propitiation, what is propitiation? And what's so important about propitiation? All right. First John 2, 2 tells us, he, Jesus, is the propitiation. For our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Of course, meaning that anybody in the whole world, the only way you're going to be propitiated in the sight of God is through Christ. That's what that means. Then 1 John 4.10, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So those words, propitiation. What does that mean? And what is the word in the Greek? In the Greek, it's helasmos. So it's a little different, okay? A different word, halasmas. It means to appease, to quench, or to eradicate. Glorious day. Jesus not only took my sins away on the cross when he atoned for my sins, but he also appeased, quenched the wrath, the anger of God for me 
for breaking his law. Beautiful. And so that's the propitiation. Therefore, the mercy seat is a propitiatory, meaning it's a monument to the propitiation of Jesus Christ where he attained my freedom and my propitiation on the cross with his sacrifice of blood. Boy, uh, I hope you understand. Or I hope you get a picture of this, but this is amazing. That, by the way, that's why God can meet with them at the propitiatory, the mercy seat, because there was a sacrifice. There was the innocent slain for the guilty, and now God's wrath has been pacified. His justice has been met, and we are now holy in Christ. Hmm? Isn't this beautiful? And he meets us on the basis of that shed blood. And when the priest puts the blood on there, that's not the propitiation. He's reminding, it's a commemoration of the propitiation that took place. He's making this a propitiatory, the place of remembrance of Christ paying for my sin. And what's that doing, by the way? It's covering the law. I can't keep that law. If I were to take that lid off in the presence of God, the law would condemn me again, and there'd be no covering, there'd be, there'd be no blood on that mercy seat, and God's wrath would consume me. That's how this works. The only reason I can ever stand in the presence of God as holy is because of that mercy seat and the blood upon it covering my sin and even the condemnation from God's morality because in Christ, I am now perfect. In Christ, it's all been covered and taken care of, and that blood is the reminder, the propitiatory of that. Boy, this is beautiful, folks. And so then we move uh, to Romans 3, okay? This is beautiful. We have this word again, Romans 3, 23. We all know that. Has anybody ever heard of something called the Romans Road? Remember the old evangelistic tool that you would use to lead people to Jesus? And we, we memorize Romans 3, 23 and begin with that, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we stop there. We can't stop there, folks. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's true. We've all sinned, folks. Falling short of the glory of God simply means you're not perfect. It's not about, oh, I committed this sin or that sin. Forget that, folks. You're not perfect. That's what you got to be to be in the presence of a holy God. You got to be perfectly holy. That's what we've fallen from. And that's why we're condemned. But look, all have sinned and come short of God's holiness. But look, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Mm, that's what those, hey, these angels, they're saying, what? Say what? Wait a minute. God is holy. His wrath judges sin. They are unholy. They deserve his wrath. Case solved. That's what we do. Send us out, God. We got the swords ready. Gift of grace, mercy, What's this? Christ himself becoming their filth and their sin? Whoa! The father crushing his son for them? What? You see, what glorious truth the gospel is. The amazing love and grace of God. Whew. That's how we can meet with him. The gift of his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's always going to go back to Jesus. There'll never be a day or a moment or a second where you're talking about salvation and redemption that you don't come back to Jesus Christ because that's the only place it is. It's in him and his shed blood, his atonement, and his high priest work for me. All of it's Christ. But look at this. Oh, here it is. Whom? Okay, so we're talking about Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood mm, to be received by faith. Now, this is not the greatest translation. I know, I, back in my old KJV only days, I shudder to hear those words. But I got to tell you, propitiation is a good, it's, it works here, obviously. But let's look at the Greek word, the actual Greek word. Oh, it's halasterion, not halasmos. Halasmos, propitiation. Halasterion, propitiatory. Literally, folks, Jesus is the mercy seat. He is the mercy seat. His blood not only makes the mercy seat possible, but he is the place where God meets with us. Now let's read this. Oh, verse 25. 
whom God put forward as a mercy seat to be received by faith. Wow. This is the call of the gospel, folks. This is it. Simple call. Bear with me just a second. So, the mercy seat whew, has been provided totally by grace through Christ. We now have a place to meet God. It's in Christ, the mercy seat. How do we do it? By faith, not by works. We don't earn a seat. By faith, we believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's the call. So here's, here's, here's what's so frustrating. We, we can't make people do this. It's by grace. It's a work of the supernatural when the Holy Spirit converts and regenerates a soul in combination with the gospel message. Example. I've been meeting with a guy for several weeks now who is dying. And uh, I talked to him at the request of his family. And, and we, we cover this, the gospel. I find out he knows the gospel very well. Can probably explain it better than I can. Been in church most of his life, read the Bible multiple, multiple times. Knows it very well. So every time I go somewhere with a gospel message, he's already there. Yeah, yeah, I know. Got it. Here's the response. I just can't believe it. Can't believe it. I said, what, what do you mean? I don't know, I can't believe it. I said, well, you, Christ, I, I know what it says. I know what he did. I just cannot believe it. I have to be honest. You know, all my life, after I was a little kid, went forward, shook the preacher's hand, said the prayer, blah, blah, blah. But he said, now I have to realize and be honest, I have no faith in this. I don't believe it. I know it. I don't believe it. Which again attests to the fact that no man can believe it, as Corinthians says. The natural man doesn't, cannot receive it. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Spirit draw him. So again, it shows us one more time, folks, that we're saved by grace. That's it. Because what's the difference here between the gospel? The gospel never changes. The gospel is a very simple truth. The just for the unjust. Christ was crushed for our sins. John 3, 36, those who believe on the Son have everlasting life. Those who do not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. Very simple. In the message itself. So why doesn't everybody just believe it? Because they can't. Now, all I do with this guy is I pray with him every time. I, and now I just go and see him. Oh, I say, hey, how are we doing? You, uh, you able to believe? This is just this week, another visit. I said, you ready to believe? He said, no. So let's pray. I just said, God, open his eyes. God, may your spirit draw him. God, may you give him the desire for Jesus Christ. May he read your word and see Christ. May he long for you. And that's all we can say. And I tell him when I leave, keep praying, brother. All right. Keep praying that God will give you the, the, the ability to rest. Because that's what it is, folks. It's by grace. So here it is, the mercy seat. Now, it's not enough to know in here and have knowledge or, or say, I know a little bit about Jesus, so I'll think about that. And then I'll also be sure I'm baptized so many times. Every tadpole in the creek knows my name, just to be sure that that's helping me. And then I'll do, so I'm, I'm going to sit a little bit on this, the gospel. I got, and then I'm we'll also make sure my church attendance is good. So I make some brownie points there and going to give some money to people. And so if I'm sitting 90% on the gospel and yet, 10% on my own works? Am I resting in the mercy seat? Am I fully trusting by faith in him alone? No. It's only when we folks come by grace, and again, only by God's grace, and we do what Jesus said. He says, all you who are laboring and you're heavy burdened and you're, you're religious and you're doing all these things, or you're burdened by your wickedness, whichever, he says, come to me. I'm the mercy seat, and guess what? I will give you rest. Rest in me. Amen. So, so right now, what is holding me? See my feet for those in the back? What's holding me up? The, well, yes, that's the whole, you jumped to my whole application. Yeah, this chair is holding me, but it represents Christ. So by faith, we rest in him. That's it. He's the mercy seat. Now you say, what's the great news about that? 
Other than, all right, we get saved once and that's it, so good. No, folks, this is why the gospel is so glorious. And once we understand this concept, this is where it applies to life every day. Not just once, every day. This is how it applies. A friend of mine who I've known for many, many years, I, I met him 28 years ago when I was the assistant pastor at Addison Baptist Church, met my wife back in those days. She wasn't my wife at the time. I was always wondering if I had a wife, and I met her. No, what do you know? I got a wife. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. No, but Ron Daly was the, is a faithful member there, loves the Lord, and just got new. And his daughter comes here, Rachel, and um, married to Steve McNamee. And a few weeks ago, gets a diagnosis. They were actually going on vacation. They were going to wait to go to the doctor until they got back. The wife said, well, we can wait, you know. But what was happening was he was forgetting things. He was dropping things. He wasn't able to keep his coordination right. Things were happening like that. And they thought, well, we can wait. But then it got really, really worse a couple of days before they left, and they decided to go to the doctor. And the diagnosis came back. A very aggressive brain cancer, tumor. And if nothing is, this is just the decision that he's finding out over the past two weeks here. If nothing is done, he has about three to four weeks to live. And if something is done, if they try to do surgery, they know they're not going to get it all and it's going to come back. Here's the decision to make. Folks, this, I know Rondale, I know his faith, I know where he's resting. He's resting in the mercy seat. You see, that's where this truth is, is, is so powerful. You know, you talk to this guy and you hear the reports, there's peace. Why? Because he's resting in the mercy seat. And what Paul said about that is that for those of us who are in Christ, the mercy seat, principalities or powers, nor death, nor pain, nor struggle, nor anything in this life shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Period. There's where the mercy seat and the truth of the tabernacle and the blessedness of the gospel are practical. You cannot get any more practical preaching than the gospel. It is the fulfillment of God's plan for his people. It is the place we rest. I pray you know it today. If you're here today and you don't know, you may have the knowledge. You may think you're doing well. You may be working hard to make God happy. Folks, the message of the gospel is simple. Give all that up. And rest in the mercy seat. The work's done. He's the only way, folks. Are you resting in the mercy seat today? Right now, as a church, we're going to celebrate the mercy seat as we do every week. And it's called communion. And this is tied, as we saw, directly back to the tabernacle again, as we see the fellowship with that bread in the tabernacle, as we're reminded of the body of Christ that was crushed for us so that we would have access to a holy God and we rejoice in that. So if you're here, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then stand with us. Let's all stand together. And let's remember what Christ has done for us and rejoice. Father God, we are amazed once again at your love for us, your word that reveals your amazing plan of redemption. Angels stare in, in amazement. And Father, we thank you that your spirit and by your grace, you've drawn us to rest in you. Those in this room that know you, that are resting in your mercy seat, we rejoice in you, we worship you, we thank you, and we remember you right now as a body together. May you be glorified. In Christ's name we pray, amen.